Welcome to today's Wednesday Live from Spark. My name is Davis Leong. I'm a supervisor here at the Science Center. Uh, and I studied chemistry and biology in school. But ever since I was a little kid, I have been just fascinated and infatuated with Mount Everest uh, in specific. And what about all of you? Um, the Earth's tallest mountain definitely holds something of a bit of a mythological status for many of us across the world. And that's what makes me so excited to get to talk to our, our guests today. Um, and as we get started today, I just want you guys to all think about uh, the places that you've gotten to travel to, uh, places that you wish you could go, and to think about what adventure and risk means for you. Because interestingly enough, there's a lot of science that goes behind the individual contributions that risk and adventure have in our own lives. The difference between fear and thrill is actually really small, and that line changes for everybody. It's all about our individual risk tolerance. So think about those moments in your life where maybe something's happened and you've truly felt that thrill palpitate throughout your body. You can usually, it's a very physical reaction. And what were those moments and how maybe did they change uh, you and how you looked at life? Uh, and especially in this time right now that we're all staying really close to home, uh, we wanna think about how we can best embody the aspects of the adventurer mindset and build ourselves up and perhaps build some of those important human connections as well. So let's get to it. So I'm super excited today to introduce my guests, uh, Jamie Clark and his son, Kobe Clark. Welcome to Live from Spark, you guys. Hello, Davis. Hey, thanks for having us. We're super excited. Thank you so much for joining us today. So, so Jamie, uh, you've lived a life of adventure. You've actually uh, attempted to summit Everest four different times. You've, you've come to the summit uh, twice. And these adventures and others in your life have led you to have a big realization with Kobe last year. And so tell us a little bit about yourself and that, uh, what adventure seeking has meant for your life and Kobe's. I've been, yeah, well, and again, thanks for having us. And, and uh, I've been really fortunate in my lifetime to be uh, able to pursue a dream. What a great gift to, to take something that you love doing and then turn it into a career. So I've been very blessed in my lifetime to be able to do that. And even as a young person growing up in Calgary and in Alberta here in Canada, I was uh, mesmerized by adventure as a whole, books that I read. And for those of us uh, who are tuning in, who know a lot about Calgary, we, you know, we're only maybe 100 kilometers, 60 miles from some of the most impressive mountains on the wor in the world. So the mountains really um, informed kind of my sense of adventure. And when you think about mountains, it's hard not to think about maybe the world's highest in the Himalaya and Nepal and Tibet and Mount Everest itself. And so as a young kid, I had this crazy little dream to maybe try to climb it one day. And I was very fortunate through my life to be able to pursue it. And th I guess that adventurous spirit has informed all parts of, of our lives. I say ours because uh, whether Kobe liked it or not, you know, you don't get to choose your parents to whom you're born. So uh, I think adventure has been a big part of our family as a whole. And we really want to embrace it, not just the physical adventure of going off and climbing mountains, but what does it mean to really be adventurous in your life, uh, to your point about taking risks and being courageous and putting yourself out there. And you can do it literally on the side of a mountain, or you can do it figuratively with your own heart or your own mind or your own community. Amazing. And so as I understand it, you have uh, some some photos that you're uh, maybe excited to share with us from Everest. Sure. We're going to try to share screen here. So we'll give a little slideshow and see what, how this works. Hopefully it'll be awesome. But yeah, Kobe and I put together, uh, oh, there we go. You tell me, Davis, if this looks any good or not to everybody. How's that looking? Good? Thumbs up. That looks great. So, yeah. Okay, perfect. So yeah, to go along with that story, there's Mount Everest. You can see it to the left in this picture, although it looks a little lower than the peak on the right. Uh, that peak is just more in the foreground. It's called foreshortening in the world of photography. So that's Everest in the far left. Actually, maybe you can even see my pointer. Can you see my pointer, Davis? Look at that. There we go. That's Mount Everest right there. I'll even maybe, I don't wanna get fancy with the spices here. So you can see Mount Everest. So that peak is the world's highest and it's there that, um, are we having some audio visual trouble, Davis? Can you hear us okay? Yeah, sorry guys. I was having some some issues with uh, with my sound system over here, but we're all good okay. now. 
Okay, good. I always assume that it's our fault. So <laughs> <laughs> if, if you can't uh, um, hear us, uh, we've done something wrong on our side. So climbing mountain, the first time I went there was 1991, a long time ago. And I was just a, a support team member. I was early in my career and I was trying to contribute to, to everybody's help. And to your point in the intro, we, uh, I tried to climb Everest four times, but only made it to the summit twice. Then the first two times that I tried to climb it, we failed. We didn't make it, which I think in some ways was actually, in retrospect, a good thing because it taught me a lot about how to deal with setback and failure and embarrassment that often comes with that and a bit of the ridicule that soon follows. So although nobody wants to make things difficult for themselves, I think it was probably a good experience to not have early success. Uh, but if anything, that kind of fueled our desire to go back, which really taught me the value of hard work. And I think that's one of the great ingredients of the adventurous life, that willingness to do the work to put the work in and these photos are kind of funny but they capture the essence of that you know there you are on a treadmill with a 50 pound backpack and five pound ankle weights you can see there you know that's a lot of grunt work but it enables you to do what well essentially more grunt work because climbing mount everest is basically a, a, a lot about resilience and fortitude and stick to itness and often the best climbers or the best athletes or the most capable aren't the ones who succeed. It's the ones who really never give up. And uh, learning that, that's kind of the idea of that adventurous spirit. It's not necessarily about the results. It's about, uh, you know, never giving up. So after that first failure, not making it, we regrouped and three years later went back to the mountain. You can see these are gear trucks in the foreground in this picture and off in the distance again Everest standing head and shoulders above the surrounding peaks. This is in Tibet. Uh, and one of maybe the more powerful lessons and I'll, I'll share a quick story and then be quiet so Cope can talk and you can ask more questions but probably came here in the uh, Kumbu Icefall which is on the south side of Everest. This is a really crazy place. You can see this climber here below this collection of ladders. Uh, and on the right side, you'll see the climber peering down into the abyss. You fall out here, Kobe and I joke that you end up in Saskatchewan. So you got to be careful <laughs> going across. Uh, nothing wrong with Saskatchewan, not, Kobe. Not. No, but it's a deep hole is what we're saying. And what I really, this was a powerful lesson because as you go across here, this is the view that you have. And this is really emblematic of life right now, I think. You know, where in our lives do we put our focus? When you're going through the ice fall like this, it's hard not to focus on the crevasses, on the holes that surround you and to have kind of a mental practice about where do you put your focus on the rungs. And for us, that's about, you know, what we can control, what we can influence. You know, when we think about what's going on in our society, locally and around the world, uh, we have to be thoughtful about those crevasses, right? We have to play our part. We have to know about the risks, but we really need to focus on the rungs as well, but what we can do every day and how we can, um, I guess, inform our behavior and our decision making. And this is one of the great lessons that that climbing mountains has taught us. And maybe more so than ever in life, we're employing those lessons. Where in your life do you focus? And whenever we're getting a little bit crazy here around the house or arguing or <laughs> getting mad at each other or struggling with what to do next, we really just like have a little mantra, focus on the rungs, focus on the rungs, focus on the rungs. And adventure really helped us understand that. So keep asking ourselves that question, you know, where in life do you put your focus? And we're trying to focus on the things we can control and influence. And I think that's one of the great lessons that, that adventuring has taught me. And, and it's something that Obi and I learned for sure on our trip across Mongolia. But to wrap up the little Everest story, there's the summit pyramid. And after having failed twice, went back to the mountain for a third time. And on that day, all those years ago, I uh, had uh, cooperating weather to a certain degree. It was minus 47 degrees and blowing at 60 kilometers an hour, but that's actually not bad weather for up there. And uh, it afforded a pretty spectacular view and stood on top of the world. And then, uh, you know, came home to the warm embrace of, of friends and family and uh, celebrating that, that kind of victory. And then we decided that that adventurous spirit had, had bought, I guess, bit us a bit. And, you know, it's one thing to go on adventures on your own or with your buddies, but it's, you know, entirely something else to go with your family. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing those photos with us. I'm, I'm watching our feed come through here and, and people are I'm just unbelievably impressed with some of those, those photos, especially the crevasse and how, how terrifying an experience that might be for, for someone with a fear of heights like my, my mother. <laughs> she didn't, never attempt anything like of that nature for sure. Um, so yeah, so let's talk a little bit about uh, th this, this journey that you guys took. Because Jamie, you had always kind of been living this, this life of adventure, right? And been, you know, a, a decade of different attempts of Everest. Uh, and recently you completed this amazing jour uh, journey with Kobe, uh, your son. So tell us a bit about the journey you undertook. And what was it spurred you that uh, down this road to to pack up from Calgary and uh, and head out and take this journey? Sure. Well, I think adventure, as we said earlier, tried to inform our, our whole family. There's four of us plus some some pets. Uh, but adventure is a big part of, of our family philosophy. You know, we wanted to live a life rich in experience, not things. And that's kind of the mantra of our, of our life. And adventure is one of those uh, things. So when Kobe was nine and his sister was seven, we as a family spent a month in Nepal. Our family vacations are often sort of centered around a, a sort of adventure theme. Uh, uh, and I've always wanted, I've always been fascinated with Mongolia. I don't know why. Nomadic lifestyle is of interest to me. Yurts are fascinating. Gurs are fascinating. And years and years, 30 plus years ago, I wanted to ride a mountain bike from the capital Ulaanbaatar across Mongolia and climb some peaks on the border with China and Russia and the Altai range there, a friendship peak and, and, and Khoitan peak. And I kind of thought as we were getting... Kobe was growing up that maybe he'd be interested in that, but mountain biking would probably take four months or five months. And maybe uh, my wife Kobe's mom and sister would miss us. <laughs> that would be too long and too grueling. So we began sort of thinking about, well, how could we do it in a, in a more expedited and perhaps fun way? And that was a, a motorcycle journey across Mongolia. It took us about a month, we figured. So we began planning and preparing for that. And, and part of the underlying motivation was just a chance for us to spend some time together. You know, when you're stuck in a tent uh, with each other from dawn till dusk and sleeping like this for a month, you know, and Kobe's heading off at 18 at the time, you're 19 now, heading off into the next phase of his life. It was like, wouldn't it be great if we could have this experience? And part of my motivation, too, was selfish in that I wanted that time with Kobe, but I also wanted us to be able to take a break from technology. You know, we both use it for school and for work. And uh, I felt myself kind of addicted to my smartphone. And, uh, you know, we, we all know the difficulties in, of social media. And so it just felt like maybe if we could go on a bit of an adventure together, it would be valuable on a lot of levels. Oh, wow, that's pretty amazing. So, so Kobe, uh, share with us some of your, your thoughts on that trip. You kind of have your dad's perspective of spurring you guys into this. Uh, but what, what was kind of going through your mind? In those early days? Yeah, I mean, growing up around this crazy dude, I'd always, you know, the idea of grand adventures has, has always been something that interests me, but at the same time terrified me as the horror stories of, you know, tall, big mountain mountaineering. You know, I've always heard crazy stuff about it. And when he mentioned it to me, you know, motorcycling and mountaineering combined in a very remote country like Mongolia, it doesn't exactly sound, you know, <laughs> safe, uh, but he, he, he talked me into it and it became something we were both super obsessed with. And we, we, we just put everything into it and decided that that was going to be our, our trip and our journey together. Davis, we have some pictures for you. Did you want us to look at some pics from that trip too, or you keep going with your question? I'll shut up. No, I, I think everyone would love to see some of the photos uh, from, from Mongolia for sure. Yeah, sure. We'll just share our screen again. Thanks everybody for your patience as we <laughs> navigate this new world of uh, communicating as we are. Mm -hmm. And we're already starting to see some questions come in. So for everyone viewing as well, you can start putting your questions in and we'll, we'll start uh, asking them, sending them across here. Uh, but yeah, why don't you guys tell us a little bit about some of these photos. So Kobe and I uh, b began training here. Any expedition like this is, uh, I think often from afar, it's hard to appreciate how much work it takes. And often uh, pretty much every project or expedition I've been involved in, when you're halfway through, you uh, think about quitting because there's a certain naivety that brings a bit of enthusiasm at the start of any project. And it sounds like a great idea and it's often fun in the beginning because it's full of learning and it's different. And then you get into kind of the middle of it and you realize, wow, you are so over your head. 
and it's daunting and you want to quit. And, and boy, this trip was no different. And that's probably a good sign that you're onto something. You know, if you feel like you want to quit, that, that's an indicator you're probably following the right path in some sort of sick, demented way. <laughs> that's the adventurer's heart, I think. You know, it, it is a, a roller coaster of emotions. But we knew that we had to do a lot of preparation, and, and neither of us are really accomplished riders of motorcycles. Um, so we really needed to do a lot of training. So we spent more than a year in planning and preparation. And those smiles you see in these pictures are a little forced. I think it's <laughs> it's more terror than it is. Woohoo, here we go. I think it was more like, oh my gosh, here we go. Oops, sorry, Cole. I'll fix that. There we go. So yeah, we have four acres out here in Springbank. And to go to Mongolia motorcycle, you have to be able to motorcycle, which I hadn't done before ever. So we got on a couple of bikes and we ripped around our little acreage until we felt comfortable on the bikes. I also had never, uh, I, want to look this way. Yeah, sorry. I also had never mountaineered unlike my dad. So we spent a lot of time uh, in the mountains in the Rocky mountains on glaciers. You know, I was learning how to work ropes and harnesses it's got my crampons on there which i was very fascinated about i kind of felt like i was stepping into my dad's shoes i had been waiting to fulfill for a very long time so the map here so if on the right side you have the capital of mongolia where 80 percent of the population lives and on the far left side 2200 ish kilometers away is Khoitan peak which is the tallest mountain in mongolia and our journey was to ride our motorcycles all the way to the basically the base of that mountain and obviously it's not a straight line there's some there's some crazy crazy <laughs> little areas we had to go through yeah. it's very rich in culture that's uh as we know him as genghis khan the 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 mongolian people idolize him that's actually the biggest equestrian statue in the world which is just i don't know half an hour outside of the the Ulaanbaatar city and on along the neck of the horse you can walk up there and, and look out into the the great land of Mongolia Genghis Khan yeah so we did some touristy stuff while we were yeah. there how could you mm -hmm. not right that's, that's part of the fun we gotta do yeah there's UB or Ulaanbaatar much like Calgary and its weather and geographic spread yeah, it was surprisingly um not that we assumed otherwise but it was quite metropolitan center and <laughs> You know, it's a really neat place to visit. Great food, some pretty exotic meals that we had there. And then off we went. Yeah. And once you leave the city about an hour out, there's there's nothing for, for days and days and days. You're just riding and there's no fences, very little civilization. And it was very interesting to go somewhere that big. I mean, it's the biggest landlocked country in the world. So you, you get on those bikes and and you just keep going and there's there's nothing there for, for as long as you can see or ride in this case. That was one of the cool things was the idea of not having a fence. Could you imagine just jumping on your bike uh, in Calgary or anywhere and we're just going that way for 2,200 kilometers and never cut across a fence and sort of a patchwork of roads used by the, the nomadic people in Mongolia to herd their sheep or goats or camels. So to have no fence and just be able to ride in any direction with no fence, you had to respect the land. And, and those who didn't really own it, but squatted multiple generations with their, with their herds. But there were no fences for 2,200 kilometers. I don't, is it weird that I think that's it's, so cool? No, it's, it was interesting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Same spot. It's a bit reminiscent of hanging yeah. out. We use pretty cool motorcycles, and, and which is a little bit of a cheat, you know, rather than a, a mountain bike. But man, it was kind of a fun way to do it. Our team was um, made up of, of Kobe and, and myself, but also Scotty Simper, who's an accomplished uh, videographer with whom I'd climbed Everest, an award-winning filmmaker, in fact, because Kobe and I wanted to, to record it. We're actually in the studio now uh, doing work with uh, our local Saw Ideas production crew putting the, the documentary together. So we were a, a team of three out there in Mongolia with some local support. It's just incredible, yeah. Look at that. There's cokes during the desert. The terrain was quite varied. Um, you know, we have the, the desert areas like that, but then also you'd pass some beautiful flora and fauna. And on any given day, it'd be 30 degrees Celsius. And then at night, it'd 
be below zero and we'd have you know frost collecting on the roof of our, our tent we, we didn't see much wildlife uh, except for some camels and uh goats goats and uh, what were the little creatures marmots there? marmots a lot of marmots yeah uh, I, I think but the camels were the coolest I camels think. are most interesting i'm yeah. digging the camel a lot of camels yeah just chilling looking at you <laughs> as you went by they're like dudes you're out of place <laughs> We, we camped mostly, well, we camped the whole time on the ground for the month, but sometimes they were in yurts or the gurs. We put that in for you. There's the, the gur camp. But usually we camped in our tent just because we were in such remote places. There wasn't much infrastructure around. Having fun, always having fun. Yeah. Even if it was hard, got to have fun. Got to have a bit of level, levity is a lot of laughter in our house. There's some argument disputes and we're certainly getting on each other's nerves. Uh, Kobe's been teaching me uh, some poker. <laughs> I've been losing, although I'm, you know, so that's, you know, there's uh, with any adventure, there's a bit of uh, suffering that goes along with it, but a lot of joy too, which is kind of what we're experiencing now. And made mention the, the documentary work, which Kobe wasn't always, you know, after a long day of riding, you're beat up and tired and now you have to talk to a camera. It's like, ah. Uh, but hopefully we'll, we'll produce something that would be kind of cool. And there's the monster itself. So that's Q uh, Kutan Peak there. Yes. Is this photo. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's from the one side. And we, oh, there's the camels that carried our gear. I wish, who, you know, looking back at this picture, I don't think he appreciated it that much. They don't have the opportunity to sign a waiver. So <laughs> they took our bags up to base camp for us. And a little out of context, but uh, we also rode some horses, one horse instead of 40. And there it is. So that's, that's, the, that's the side that we went up just along that ridge. And it was my first real mountaineering experience. Uh, Scotty and my dad treated it like a piece of cake, but I was, I was struggling. But it was amazing. I, 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 can, I can understand the, the sense of reward of getting on top of that thing. It was it's, it's a proper peak. 11 people have lost their lives over the years climbing there. So it's not to be taken lightly. Um, you know, you're fully roped up and engaged and, and, and full on at higher elevation. You know, we're just camping at, at 12,000 feet. The summit's at 14. So you're, you're crammed <laughs> into your tent, uh, which is another tight proximity. But like we said, it wasn't all, you know, seriousness. There was lots of uh, a laughter. And it, it, for me, it made it maybe the best trip of my life was the chance to be able to, to do that. In any given day, we'd be under a lot of duress, but there was a lot of time hanging out in your tent talking, which is kind of reminiscent now as we're isolating as families with each other, finding our own space in the corner of the tent or in the corner of your apartment or house, but also coming together. And, and it makes for conversation that maybe you normally wouldn't have because it's interrupted by the hustle and bustle of life. So we're kind of on expedition life right now, or is this was expedition Mongolia? We're all kind of right now in expedition life. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good point, right? It's so, it's almost like that was the trial run for, for yeah. COVID self isolation. I can tell um, my friends that I prepared for it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, you you already have all the coping mechanisms. We're all just learning. Uh, so we're going to start getting to some of the questions here right. from our stream because it is just uh, blowing up. And one of the ones that, that everybody really wants to know is, is how long did the journey through Mongolia take? A month. We left month. July 28th from Calgary and we got back August 30th, I believe. Mm -hmm. Or sorry, sorry. June yes. 28th. No. Yeah. Yeah, we left too. Right. Around June. There. A month, a yeah. month full of August. Full well, all of yeah, August. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and on this journey, um, what were some, were there some moments where you, you had, you had pause and you had to think like, are, are we a little in over our heads? Uh, and did you find that like, does that happen just at any point in a journey or is it, you know, uh, Jamie, you kind of talked about there's a halfway moment where you almost, you, you want to feel like giving up. Um, but yeah, did you have many of those just, are we in over our head? I, on day three of the riding, so we're, you know, we have a while to go yet. I had a very bad crash on the motorcycle. Um, I just hit a rock. And at that point, I didn't have a very good attitude about the, what, what laid ahead. And I think you have to think to yourself a lot, you know, it's, this is only the beginning and 
if one crash won't kill you, you just have to, you have to, you have to keep going and stay patient with yourself. But there was, yeah, there was a couple moments. It was not luxurious. You know, you're, you're in a tent day in and day out and you're, you're riding all day. And then, so there's not a lot of resting. I think we were challenged daily by, by different, by different things, especially throughout the biking and the mountaineering. That was probably the toughest day. I think in many ways with seeing Kobe crash, uh, and, and then thinking, wow, this is what I've done, right? There were concerns by our family about the two of us going. How hard is it for Kobe's mom and sister? We're gone for, on this grand adventure for a month. It's kind of selfish. And, and they're home wondering. We're out of communication. We, we had a small uh, device, a Garmin locating device that we could send updates, but basically said, all's okay. There's not a lot of information for the family. You know, we're off having this amazing experience, but we're right in the middle of it. And then you're leaving friends and family behind to worry about you. So uh, that that's tough. Uh, and then seeing Kobe crash and thinking, oh, great. And I've pulled, dragged my son into this stuff only to have him, you know, break his neck or so. You know, how do you manage? I didn't break my neck, by the no, way. I didn't break my neck. <laughs> yeah. How do you manage that? That's a constant struggle about risk perceived and real. And, um, and, and some people look at it and think it's crazy. And, and um, people think, well, you have a death wish. And without sounding cliche, it's kind of like, well, how do you balance that with having a life wish? Like you want to live well, but you don't want to do foolish things. So, you know, that this trip for me was a lot of that, where I was just like, oh, what have we done? This was a great idea on paper. Uh, man, maybe we should pull the plug and just call it a day. So I remember those moments. You're my worst influence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we got another question here from Kathy. Uh, she wonders, so on this journey, how did you guys uh, replenish like fuel, uh, food for the bikes? Uh, if you had any like flat tires or stuff like that, how did you get material when you were, you know, thousands of kilometers away from the nearest city? Right. Great question. So we had local support in, um, in Mongolia that could uh, travel with us in part to help bring in supplies. We had supplies uh, well, obviously for the motorcycles to keep them running the fuel as well as food for us. We shipped in advance the climbing gear so that we didn't have to carry it all to a, a, a small town called Ugli on the western reaches of Mongolia so that we had our kind of our motorcycle camp and then we could send forward the, the climbing gear. So we had help in country to move things around. Otherwise, it would have been really difficult to pull off 100% self-supported. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, uh, and so one of the big things about this trip was to disconnect from certain types of technology, in particular cell phones and the thing, those things that we're quite dependent on today and, and connection in both in burning time and making great use of our time. But without those types of technologies, how did uh, Patrick wants to know, how did you manage like your navigation? Uh, did you use maps? Did it, was it just all kind of um, by road or GPS? We used a real combination. I think we needed, you need, so we had GPS, you had the, you know, when Kobe and I are talking about getting away from technology, we're not Luddites, you know, we don't, it's not like we hate technology. Look what it's doing for us today, communicating. Uh, so I think it's, but it's technology in the right measure. You know, it's about maybe disconnecting from technology so that you can connect with each other, that whole idea of disconnect to reconnect. So I think it's all about in the right measure. And so you want to use that technology for sure. You're going to use the GPS. You're going to have that for backup. But then you also need analog navigation. We have maps. You have a compass. You're tracking your progress each day. You're, you know, you're pulling out the maps at breaks to make sure you know where you are on the map and then finding features in the land as handrails, as they're called in navigation parlance, so that you are constantly knowing where you are and you kind of use the best of both worlds. So you have uh, a complement of skills. You can read a map and you can operate the GPS. We used yeah. like, so everything is in Cyrillic, which is, you know, Russian-esque looking languages, which we don't know how to read. So we'd have a map of Mongolia in English and then a map of Mongolia in Cyrillic and the signs, we'd use lakes. Um, as checkpoints and as you rolled up to the lake you'd see the name of the lake on an old road sign in Cyrillic and we would match it on the map and then then translate it try and translate it to English to see where we were and where we started throughout the day and we kind of drew a little line where we went. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh that's fantastic. Uh, 
Another question here about uh, some of the supplies. Uh, so Penny's son Avery wants to know what did you, what did you eat for food? Did you have to? Are there specific considerations that you make for food on a trip like this? There you didn't. You're not picky. That's for sure. Uh, we we ate a lot of mutton. Mutton. Mutton is a, uh, a very popular food in Mongolia. It's basically old old sheep, right? Yeah. It's, it's not so good. Poorly cured. It's very cheap to maintain. It has a very rubbery texture. You can really smell it. Yeah. Um, that wasn't great. That that made us sick. But it, don't it, want to be it, negative, right? It, but, no, no. If we, if I I'm never eat. I'm gonna recommend to you go to Malaysia and try the mutton there because it is delicious. But oh, is <laughs> I it? Yeah. Wow. Okay. okay. Do you notice? Do you know? Okay. Malaysian mutton is a little better than Mongolian mutton. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. It's this a dish also- called rendang. Yeah. Okay. Nice. And we are working, you know, you're in, in this sort of a remote region. So you don't want to be picky or rude, but wow, if we don't eat another mutton stew, yeah. no problem. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're so hungry though. Anyway, and you're very appreciative of what anybody makes you that mm. I don't know, it tasted pretty good in, in the meantime. So we would come across encampments. So as we traveled, you would see the um, nomadic Mongolians would move there with their herd of, um, you wouldn't need sort of temporary villages that would be set up depending on the season and that we could go in there and pick up supplies um, and whatever was available. If it was, you know, if your vegetable was going to be spinach, you got some spinach. And if it was, you know, we ate a lot of rice. Um, we tried to travel with our, our own supplies so that if it got, you know, if we had to go a few days with uh, without much food, we could kind of ration. Um, but you Unfortunately, in that situation, you can't get all the details worked out. And I think that's maybe one of the good things about planning an expedition is that in the ideal world, you could plan everything and you could have all the answers to all the questions and then you could sleep well at night and know that, hey, we've got it dialed and then off you go. But kind of the reality of and they're not just climbing mountains but across Mongolia, it's kind of like life in general there comes a certain point where you have enough information and the details taken care of, but it would just take too much time to get everything right. And then the opportunity would pass or you'd never get started. So there's this sort of painful spot where we have enough information to be safe and we've got it organized and we're properly prepared and been working at this for a year and a half. Do we have all the answers? No, we don't even know some of the questions that we should be asking. But if you feel like you have the confidence that you prepared well enough that whatever comes, whatever you encounter, you'll be able to figure out your way around it. And uh, food is like that, which is hard because it's hard to be comfortable with that level of unknown. Um, But somehow you feel like, I don't know what's going to happen, but whatever it is, I think we can work it out. I did eat a lot of Mars bars. They did have Mars bars at about every stop we went to. So it was those kept me going. Bars. Yeah. yeah, those are delicious. All Mars bars. bars. Mars bar never fails. It's always consistent. Even a stale, multiple melted, multiple frozen yeah. Mars. Mm, tasty. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Uh, and so, yeah, like, and, and uh, obviously, right now as a society, we don't really have the opportunity to go and do a big trip like this right now, at least, you know, while, while this is all settling down. So, and even at home, right? A lot of people missing the mountains, uh, the parks are closed, uh, but what kind of adventuring tips might you have for people uh, to have like in their own backyards or ways that things you've learned in your adventuring lifestyle that you can put into place, you know, in your own backyard in Calgary? Interesting. I think uh, if you have always thought of like an easy skill, maybe it's inside or outside to do, now is the perfect time to do it. I, I dusted off a unicycle in my shed the other day and learned to ride it, which kept me busy. It's definitely, it's weird being so cooped up because, you know, especially as a, as a teenager, you're so used to, you know, going outside, especially this time of year, which is a very short season in Calgary. Uh, you you, you want to go outside with your friends and, and do a bunch of stuff because, you know, for the time we have here, uh, but you can't. So I think, you know, if, if you've always wanted to learn how to skateboard, as weird as that sounds, or, or ride a unicycle, or, you know, play catch, it's just, it's as easy as that. Just go, if you have an idea to go do something, now's the time to do it, because uh, there's no, there's nothing else going, going on. Mm-hmm. Backyardigans was, remember Backyardigans? Backyardigans is, a, is a, remember Backyardigans? Yeah. Great show when Kobe was a kid, and that's, it's easy to get wrapped up and to your point about the exotic adventure and that sounds cool and it's interesting, but uh, I think code makes a great 
uh, that's a cool answer because you're right. Adventure comes in all sorts of different forms. And it really, in its heart, is about you engaging in something where the outcome is unknown. Like, who knows? Jump on the unicycle. You're going to be any good at that. And just throwing yourself into it. And uh, it's been a good lesson for us, I think, because we can often get distracted by the cool next adventure. And we get asked that a lot. What's next? Where are you guys going? What's next? What's next? And, uh, well, who knew that uh, unicycling? Kobe's now taking up playing basketball, unicycling, riding around, shooting hoops from his unicycle. <laughs> That's good adventure. Mm -hmm. I know. I'll check back in in a week and he'll be juggling chainsaws or something. <laughs> right. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so what did you guys use? Cause you mentioned, right. You're, you're spending basically like dusk to dawn in this tent on the trip, especially because the temperatures at night are so cold. So what kind of things did you use to entertain yourselves, especially, um, trying to disconnect from certain types of social media and stuff? Each other. Um, I like to pick on him, which entertains me. It's true. And, uh, he likes to pick on me, which entertains him. So I think the, the elimination of distraction via smartphone allowed us, you know, it, it kind of, it keeps the conversations going. We noticed that there's no break. There's no break of silence. You, you, you sit there and you just continue to talk because there were nights, you know, there were, a, there was a whole day where we were cooped up uh, due to a, a pretty big storm. So we um, love it or not had to hang out the entire time. And it was, it was interesting just to, to see where all the conversations let us because yeah, there's, there's not much you can do outside of the tent not much you even want to do outside of the tent because you've been riding all day and there's no, there's no Netflix to watch. Uh, so, so we just entertained each other, which, you know, was, was great in some moments and pretty annoying in others. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did see that a lot when you, when you think about conversation and in a lot of ways, the conversations here at home are shorter or they don't have the space as soon as there's a, a pulse or a break in the conversation, something else distracts you. I've got a to-do list. Uh, my phone grabs my attention, whatever. And we found there that you could be sitting in the tent and have five minutes pass in silence, uh, but there was nowhere to go, which was lovely because you were boxed in a little bit. And then a deeper thought would come, which we maybe would never have had the chance to even have back home. So kind of being stuck, although it was uncomfortable, it taught us that it was a whole nother level. And Kobe said in one interview with the media after the trip somewhere, I really got to know my dad, which kind of struck me as a wonderful thing, but a sad thing too, because we lived together. We've been living together for 18 years and I felt the same thing. I really got to know my son and I uh, saw him in a whole new way. And it changed our roles a little bit, which is kind of what's going on now too. You know, as the dad, I was always like, oh, you know, nitpick, do this, do that, trying to be a good parent. And for us, I think we made a transition on that trip through these conversations. And, you know, really, I found a whole new kind of appreciation and respect for Kobe and his ability. And we were under a lot of our pressure and every day he stepped up. And when we were scared and it got ugly, I just saw my son just get up and do it and face it every day. And we kind of went through that hardship together, which brought us closer. And we, we kind of transitioned from just being father and son to, to being friends. That's so sweet. <laughs> um, and, yeah, man. He's mocking us, I think. <laughs> no, David, that's that's mother and dad. <laughs> um, so, so you mentioned you, you, know, you learned a lot about each other and, and the roles that you play in each other's lives. Uh, what are some of the most surprising things that you learned about each other that you maybe didn't know before the trip? Oh, I don't know if I should say that. <laughs> <laughs> um kobe I, says i swear a lot more when i'm on he does he does he's very uh, he's conservative with the cussing in the house but as soon as you take him to mongolia he's uh, he's got a he's got quite the mouth on him <laughs> um i don't know i think um we're very similar in you know it seemed almost that i was hanging out with one of my 19 year old friends in mongolia which was interesting uh he, he the the father mentor idea kind of disappeared and it and it came to us just just hanging out almost it was it was pretty cool it was not father son it was just friends <laughs> <laughs> I, I think for me it gave me a chance to um you know see kobe in a new light which i had 
I, I don't know, maybe that's just my personality or maybe parenting as a whole, you know, you come through the front door and what do you see? Well, I see dishes on the counter and I see shoes here and I see a jacket thrown there. And I, and I just feel like as a parent, it was like, oh, and you feel like that's part of your job. You're trying to help. Look, buddy, you can't just, you know, eat a peanut butter sandwich and leave everything out. You got to clean up after yourself or whatever the rules are. And I felt like that kind of dominated a lot of our, our relationship before Mongolia. You're just parenting, 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 and get and, and and we're kind of back at that now. Being isolated is that you, you don't have to be full twenty four seven parenting. We can sit there and play Texas Hold'em together and share and learn and, and exchange. And we could we were both learning to ride motorcycles, so we were doing something both together. And I, I can't, still can't ride a unicycle and. So the role shifted. He got to be teacher teaching me and I could be mentor and teaching him and the roles were shifting. And it, I think it taught me that there's, um, you know, a lot more to Kobe than um, just what you, I had seen as being his dad. Amazing. Well, thank you for sharing that. I, I'm going to I'm going to pivot a little bit here quick. Just ask a couple questions about Everest. Uh, so a lot of people want to know how long does the journey uh, climbing Everest take? And maybe even from like, uh, if you want to walk us through like the preparation time beforehand and the actual climb, Jamie. Sure. The, the trips themselves are about nine weeks, really, from um, sort of uh, arrival in Kathmandu and, and doing your work, depending on where you're approaching the mountain on the north side in Tibet or the south side in Nepal, uh, Nepal through the Kumbu Icefall. So give or take, it's nine weeks. You can sort of plan for that. Uh, the, the climbing itself on the mountain could go a lot faster, but you have to acclimatize. And that's the big rate determining step. And that's just as a result of the elevation gain. Our bodies need to adapt. If we all right now jump to the base camp or the summit of Everest, we'd be pretty quickly dead. So you need to let your body acclimatize. And that's why you need some patience and it takes some time. Plus you have to uh, sort of study the weather patterns and get into the feel of the mountain and the rhythm of the place so that you're prepared understanding the snowpack and finding a, your safe route and getting that all in position and then moving gear into position food and fuel and rope and all the supplies needed on the mountain so you're you're going up and down up and down up and down up and down you climb the mountain multiple times in terms of elevation gained by the time you get to the top and then as far as the preparation to go and this is a bit of a i guess a hot topic around commercial climbs and uh, buying your way onto an expedition, which you know makes a lot of sense in many ways, uh, but there is no shortcut to gaining the mountain skill. And you can read all the books and do a few training climbs, but I think to climb a mountain like Everest safely, you need to log in the hundreds of days in the backcountry, climbing smaller mountains and, and working your way up. And I really think that's a five, six, seven year process with a, a fairly dedicated pursuit, if not longer because there's no shortcut to really understanding how to manage yourself in, in dangerous terrain and how to read uh, the climbing circumstances, snowpack and so forth. And we were able to on, on Coyton to short track Kobe's experience, partly because Scotty and I feel quite capable in the mountains and uh, the nature of, of the climbing on Coyton was one that we felt good with. But even that was a, a, a bit of a stretch so it takes a long time to get comfortable making mountain decisions and it's dangerous to shortcut that. Wonderfully, there are great climbing companies around town like our own very own Yamneska Mountaineering School down the road from here in Calgary out in Canmore. They have great three day programs, summer long programs. Uh, so if anyone who's watching is, has an interest in mountain climbing, I really would suggest that they do maybe a three day intro to mountaineering at Yamneska Mountain School. Uh, they're great facilitators and instructors. They're super safe, very, very capable, some of the best climbers in the world. And they could really help you understand safely how to move in the mountains and get a taste of it. See if it's something that you like. And then maybe you're going to need to commit a lot of years before you head to the Himalaya. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to go back to the feed here. Uh, this is a question for Kobe. Uh, Paul wants to know if you could organize the next adventure for the two of you. Uh, what would it be? And and Paul wants no input from Jamie on this one. Kobe only. <laughs> I like it, Paul. I like it. <laughs> yeah, give you a hot sec to think about that one. You know, ever since the movie came out, I've been very fascinated with Madagascar. 
as its own island. And I hope it's what it's like in the movies, but I think going to Madagascar and going to the rainforests would be, would be pretty amazing. Hopefully see some, some, some lemurs. Uh, I've always been wanted to go to Fiji. I don't know. We've talked about going to the happiest place on earth, Bhutan, which, which would be quite amazing. Hard to get to, but riding motorcycles through Bhutan would be, would be pretty interesting. I mean, but I think Madagascar lies number one. Number one, Madagascar. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm in. <laughs> uh, so that, yeah. And um, the question a bit for the both of you in, in talking about uh, the preparation that goes into a trip like this, w would you say that this, this type of, event, of adventuring, especially Kobe is this, this Mongolia trip was really one of your first exposures to this, that extreme level of it. Do you think that's something that, you know, anyone can do with the proper training and, and motivation, or is it something that like, you really kind of have to be pre determined for almost in a sense. No, I think anybody, I think anybody can do it. I, I did not know how to ride a motorcycle. I got my motorcycles license. I think the week of we left, I, I mean, don't approach it like that because it was stupid and I crashed and hurt myself. So, I mean, a, a preparation is very key, but if I think you should never be held back by, by anything, if, if, you know, if going to Mongolia is what you want to do and, you feel like you're prepared for it and it by that time it's just it's just confidence in yourself and and, and going to do it i think anyone anyone can do anything especially when it comes to some, seeing the world and seeing other cultures i think that's a super important part of life mm -hmm. I'm, I'm i would yeah, yeah. I, I agree with Bob. i think it's something for us to and it wasn't lost on us on the trip is that we really appreciate the privilege that we have to go to be able to do this stuff and um yeah i, I think that's basically the point of it yes we've made decisions um to support this we make this a priority uh, in our life and then dedicate the funds and create a lifestyle to support it. But there's also this real underlying privilege that Kobe and I have that uh, it's even a, a possible for us to even do these kinds of things. And that's not available to everybody. So, it, you know, I think it's important to keep that in, in mind. And along with that comes almost um, an understanding of how lucky we are to be able to do it. Um, but we, it, yeah. I don't know. It's such a, sometimes we feel like, you know, or I don't want to say what say that where they're guilty about being able to do stuff like that, but just that we appreciate that we're darn lucky that we can go and do it and design our life in that fashion. And not everybody can. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Kobe, uh, what kind of, what words of encouragement might you give to some of the young kids that might be watching uh, today or seeing the adventures that you and your dad took? And might be looking to emulate that in their own lives. <laughs> oh, geez. don't do it! No. <laughs> don't go with your dad. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, again, if you have the opportunity, I think growing up, you know, you're very sheltered by your own society, and you see, you know, the same people every day and and the same place. So, if you have the opportunity and 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 the privilege, which is, you know, can sometimes be taken for granted, I say go do it. Uh, I think. You know, especially at this time, you know, graduating high school, it's, there's a next step, you know, it's, it's, you're expected to go on to this next chapter, whether it's post-secondary school. And, but if you have kind of this urge to go, go see the world and see what's, what's really out there, take that step. It's, it's, it's something you'll never regret. And it's something that you will regret not doing, I think. Awesome. Uh, so going back a little bit to the, the climb uh, at, in Mongolia, especially, uh, what did you learn about the mountains there, like that mountain range specifically, and like what kind of wildlife and stuff did you see? Uh, Amanda wants to know. Amanda, Amanda, good question, Amanda. It was pretty remote. We didn't once we were on the mountain proper. You get the odd uh, crow the size of a small dog flying around, but uh, at that high elevation, you know, the camels would help get our gear to base camp. And you'd find, uh, you know, the odd sort of ground squirrel like creature running around camp. But because you're up high and there's not a lot of food stuff and through the winter, there's, you know, eight feet of snow uh, and obviously on the mountain itself, on the glacier and above. So 
wildlife once we were in the altai mountains there on the border with russia and china there's not a lot of uh, vegetation or wildlife and we didn't see uh, much of anything once we got on the mountain mm -hmm. interesting uh, and what what's the view uh from the top of the peak look like uh both Cuton and uh, and everest yeah oh boy yeah a lot of people want to know <laughs> can we go back to uh can we do a little slideshow and can I share? Are we allowed to share, Davis? Were you allowed to share? Absolutely. We already did. Uh, well, let's go back. I can show, we can show you the quick view of uh, is that there? there we go. So Everest stands over 29,000 feet. And uh, once you're up that high, you can really get a tremendous, and that was, um, a pretty special place although when you're at the summit you're kind of at your most vulnerable so you're only going to spend well as little time as possible but it's kind of hard to leave there so I take a few pictures and then uh, pack up and head out of there and then the view from up here well I think in many ways was equally spectacular uh, this is the view which way direction is that look that's looking into mongolia so let's look from the top so we're on the border there standing there now looking in china east. looking east into right exactly good call so really that i don't know for me anyway the aesthetic of of mountains and climbing is uh, arguably the best part because with every step you know, new elevation and perspective shift stuff to look at reveals itself, um, which is really a, a kind of a meditative um, process to see it all unfold before you. It's, you know, staring at the picture now as we talk about it, you know, there's just so many places your eye can go. And uh, I think that's one of the great rewards. Unfortunately, you're only, you're only up there for a few minutes, so you have to really set it into your memory and then carry it with you afterwards. And pictures like this are certainly helpful. Mm -hmm. And so, so Kobe, I, I mean, you have not yet climbed Everest, but in listening to stories from your dad, is that something that you would aspire to do? And do you think that one day maybe you and your dad will <laughs> together? I figured this question uh, has come. <laughs> this is probably the most asked question of is my it? entire life. Oh, yes. Sorry. No, it's totally fine. Um, I and I've thought about it so much. You know, given that everybody wants to know. Um, and I don't have an answer yet. I, when I was younger, I definitely would have said no, because I hated when my dad would leave on these dangerous mountain trips. Uh, but now that I'm growing older, it's kind of a, I know it's kind of a, it almost feels like a, a forced upon bucket list thing to do. So I've been, I've been thinking deeply about it. I still, I still don't know yet. It's a, uh, it definitely, it definitely runs in the family and would be cool to, to walk the same steps, but I'm not sure yet. It's, it's a pretty crazy mission. Whew. Mm -hmm. I would say, I would, you would crush it for <laughs> sure. I mean, it's a lot of work. You'd certainly do. I'd be terrified as a parent uh, you know, if Cope was going to go off and do that because having been there, I know all about it. Uh, and I'm now in my early 50s. So my climbing skill is declining as is my fitness. So, you know, I'd love to go. Could I'm I go, on my own. Can I go with you? Oh, I would wow. love to go back, but I don't know. <laughs> would you want me to go with you or would you prefer to do it on your own? I'm not sure, man. <laughs> requires some thought yeah good question we don't know i don't know if i'd want to go because i've been there four times and plus it's your thing so would i want to bother you <laughs> but then i'd be worried about you but then i'd probably be the problem because right. you'd be so much fit fitter and stronger and i'd be slow and the weakest the weakest link exactly and i'd hold you back and then you couldn't make it because i got sick right it's a lot you opened a big old can of worms there yeah <laughs> no, I, I think I know what you guys are talking about tonight after the call. <laughs> uh, so, so, Kobe, um, of, of, I don't know if you've been able to go on other adventures since or before Mongolia, but uh, but what one was your favorite and or what part of Mongolia maybe was your favorite adventure? Uh, it's come up a couple of times in the, in the chat here. You know what? I think um, Mongolia was my only real, real adventure, I'll call it. Um, other than, you know, various Canadian adventures my parents would take me on, which were always very fun. But, you know, you're, you're traveling into a very foreign part of the world that you've never been to and you're really engulfed in the culture. 
Um, there's no North American influence there. You're kind of you're kind of on your own. Uh, so I'd say that was my favorite and favorite part of Mongolia. I would have to say there was this. Ah, oh man, there's so many. Every, everything's so cool. Um, but when we rode the horses down from base camp, uh, that was amazing. And we got to this park gate where, you know, it seemed almost like the, the BAMP for Mongolians. They, they go to this park gate, you know, a, a long ways from base camp of Khoiten, but it was kind of a hangout spot. So right. you, you, you hung out in, in this little campground essentially and everyone's driving their their big trucks and stuff and which is very popular there and they're camping so you kind of you had a little party with them and they're very inviting and uh, maybe a little too inviting they really like to party and hang out with us and and that was that was interesting i felt i felt very accepted which which was which was cool you know being a minority in a very very far away country they they loved us and fed, fed us and it was it was, it was really cool right. to see everyone I think that's where we had some Genghis Khan vodka. Too. We did have the Genghis just, Khan vodka. Just a little smidge. Yeah. Just a they little tuck smidge. toy. Tuck toy is tuck Mongolian toy. cheers. Yeah. A lot which, of uh, toy. Yeah. Which, and there's never an excuse not to do it. So <laughs> yeah. quite, careful. quite the party atmosphere there, which is, you know, right up our alley. And, and, <laughs> and it was after a very long trip. So I think, yeah, coming back to that part gate still engulfed in the, in the very, you know, nomadic lifestyle, but everyone was having a good time and, and we are all sharing similar interests, you know, even though we're so different. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, how do you handle like the adrenaline from something like this? Uh, Cause it must just come and go in these big waves or does it just become your new normal? The bikes, the bike part was probably the most, the most adrenaline. I mean, you know, there was, there was moments, well, there was days that we rode on these these long stretches of highway because it was you know we're running out of time and we need to get you know somewhere very fast and, and i think riding on a motorcycle in in you know and mongolia it's not crazy with the traffic laws everyone's kind of going at their own own pace so you know you hear these scary stories about motorcycle accidents and it's not a very safe activity to begin with so you know we'll, we'll make a pass on a van or something and it's kind of thinking I'm on this bike and I'm going a hundred kilometers an hour. You know, if something went wrong here, that would be really, that would be really bad. And I had that thought a lot and it, it kind of haunted me over and over again, especially after my crash on day three year, you know, we would probably be going 65 to 80 kilometers an hour on average. And, you know, if anything goes wrong at that speed, it's uh, it's hard to walk away from it. Luckily I did. Um, not to sound all dramatic, but I think the adrenaline on the bikes and I don't, there was never a point where you were super comfortable. And I think as soon as you get comfortable on, on something like that, that's when you bite it and hurt yourself, which we, we experienced. So I think, you know, doing something that dangerous and mountaineering as well, but it's a little more slow pace. You have a little more control. You know, this is your reaction time is no matter what slower than what goes on around on around you on the bike. So you are always on your toes and always thinking about, what possibly could hurt you next. <laughs> yeah. Which is not a great part. People think, oh, you must be thrill seekers, adrenaline junkies. I mean, there are moments of that and, and sure that's part of it um, that adds flavor to the whole experience, but it's not that. In fact, that's kind of draining, isn't it? You, you almost draining. have like, oh, this adrenal fatigue um, and it's not maybe healthy over the long haul. So, uh, you know, these activities that are of interest do require a bit of that, but that's not really the thing we're looking for. At least that's not what I, I enjoy. In fact, if you could take more of the risk out of the equation, I think we'd be prone to do more activities um, because it's, it's the whole process and the whole experience that we're really interested in, not just you know, risking our lives, which seems so silly. Amazing. Thank you guys. So we're, we're coming close to the end of the, the live stream here. I know, right? It goes by quick. Um, what are, are there a couple last, closing thoughts that either of you have you wanted to share maybe with, with everyone that's viewing? No. Do you want me to go first? You go first. Okay. I'm going to buy you time while you noodle on that. 
I think, uh, well, first of all, thank you for having us. A really a, a super treat, again, a privilege and a luxury for us to be a part of it. There's lots of people you could invite to this. So Kobe and I are, are honored to speak on both of our behalf to be able to connect with you and uh, chat a little bit about these things. I, th I think if there's something to take away from it, I think Kobe's point about you know backyard uh, adventures, the backyardigans, learning to unicycle, that's a powerful lesson that this last five, six weeks have taught us as a family and I think we'll in part change our plans as we move forward and uh, gives us a little more appreciation of what's happening in our backyard. I think that uh, ultimately for us and maybe as a result of those who have watched that, that, that Kumbu ice ball picture about where you put your focus, that's a big mantra for us around the house right now is you know, if there's a parting thought, it's like, yep, there's a lot of crevasses around us, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of concern. I'm unemployed. I'm sure many people who are watching or whose parents are, are unemployed or our lives have changed. Um, we know that, so we got to know those crevasses. But if we can focus as individuals and as families on the cravat, on the rungs, on those ladders, what we can do every day, staying fit, staying healthy, eating well, getting some exercise, staying together, that's, um, that, that's uh, important stuff. That's what I would suggest. Stay happy, stay focused, stay outside. That's, that's, that's what I would say. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. This was absolutely you. amazing. Uh, you know, sorry to everyone whose questions we didn't get to. There were so many of them. Uh, but, you know, this was absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much, guys, for, for joining us today. And, uh, yeah, Thanks best of luck with everything else and future adventures. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. <laughs> So, and, uh, and for everyone else out there, remember, uh, you know, to stay curious as we explore the wonders of our universe. And thank you guys so much for joining us uh, for today's uh, live segment. Uh, join us next Wednesday at 11 a.m. We're going to have a live conversation and Q&A with Dr. Shauna Pandaya. She's a martial artist, an aquanaut, a citizen scientist, astronaut candidate, and a physician. And uh, of course, for more science, uh, follow us on social and visit us at sparkscience.ca. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you again next week.